Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Today's case is one of the most insane cases I have come across in a very, very long time. Some of the things that go on in today's case are truly unbelievable that it feels fictional. Love you. You want me to stop? I'll stop. You don't want you to stop. I'm sorry. You can tell me, baby. Spit it out. It is 9.55 p.m. Gloria, you did tell the truth. I'm afraid, Larry. I'm so scared. They will kill me. Your parents? Yes, my parents will kill me. In the fall of 2010, a man called Larry Ray was a pretty important, successful person. He had friends in high places. Well, in the fall of 2010, his life completely fell apart. He even landed himself in prison. However, when he got out of prison, he decided to move in with his daughter. Now, the problem with that is that his daughter was a college student, which meant that Larry Ray moved in with his daughter and all of her college friends that lived in the same dorm. And Larry was a creepy dad. He was sleeping on the sofa in the communal area and he was getting too friendly with the girls that also lived in the dorm, if you know what I mean. But another thing about Larry that you need to know is that he is a master manipulator. It is actually scary how good he is at manipulating people. So that's what Larry did. He took all of these college students who were vulnerable, impressionable, and he manipulated them and they became his puppets. And Larry Ray had himself a little following, a little cult, if you will. Yes, we are covering a cult today. And in true cult fashion, it was a sex cult because of course it was. This case is kind of referred to as the college sex cult and it's just so disturbing. And it just blows my mind that this cult, everything that went on, happened in modern times, happened in front of people. And I just have no words. I am left speechless so many times for today's case. So let's just jump in. So before we get started, I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that will keep you safe and secure online. Because did you know when you are out and about using public Wi-Fi, anyone could be lurking around the corner ready to steal your private information. Hackers can use public Wi-Fi to spy on you, steal your credit card information, all of your passwords, private and personal photos, which freaks me out. So whenever I'm out in public, whenever I'm in a coffee shop or a restaurant and I am connecting to a public Wi-Fi, I always make sure to open up ExpressVPN on my phone and connect. And it's really that simple. And now I know that I am safe and secure when I'm using the internet. And ExpressVPN is super easy to install and you can use it on all devices. You can use it on your laptop, your iPad, your phone. In fact, you can even install ExpressVPN on your TV if you have a smart TV or an Amazon Fire Stick. And in today's world, we're all using the internet constantly. We have so much data and personal information stored on the internet. Using ExpressVPN in today's world is essential and I highly recommend it. But not only does ExpressVPN keep you safe and secure when you're using the internet, ExpressVPN allows you to watch pretty much any TV show or movie from anywhere in the world. For example, if you have a Netflix account, you are restricted to what you can watch based on the country that you live in, but not anymore because ExpressVPN allows you to change your geolocation. So if you go onto Netflix and there's nothing to watch, just change your geolocation and you have access to Netflix from all over the world. Recently, I have been binging the US office. The US office is probably one of my favorite TV shows ever. And I'm really lucky because it is on the UK Netflix. However, I looked and it's not on the US Netflix. And I'm like, what? So if you are living in the US or if you're living in any country where the US office is not available on Netflix, all you need to do is download ExpressVPN, change your geolocation to the UK and voila, you have access to all nine seasons of the US office. And if you guys wanted to check out ExpressVPN for yourselves, then you can go and get yourselves three months of ExpressVPN for free by going to the link in my description box, which is expressvpn.com forward slash Danielle. And using that link really does help out this channel because it lets ExpressVPN know that you can from this video. So I just want to thank ExpressVPN again for sponsoring today's video, but I want to thank every single one of you watching right now because truly, I really mean this, without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. Larry Ray, he was actually born Lawrence, but he goes by Larry. I'm just going to call him Larry. Was born in 1959. An exact date of birth is not known. And he grew up in Brooklyn, New York, where he lived with his mom, dad, and younger brother, Carl. Now, not much is actually known about Larry's childhood 
childhood. However, it has been said by Larry himself, I just want to stress that, that his childhood was filled with terrible abuse. So Larry's parents divorced pretty much immediately after he was born and Larry moved in with his maternal grandparents. And this is where Larry was sexually abused by his granddad. From the ages of six to seven, this is when Larry was reportedly taken down to the basement every single day to be, quote, penetrated by his granddad. And to make matters even worse, the grandmother knew this was going on. She knew that her husband every day was sexually abusing their grandchild. But did she do anything about it? Did she try and stop it? No. Instead, she would physically abuse Larry. But apparently from a very young age, Larry's grandmother had it in for him. She would beat him for the smallest infractions. She would verbally abuse him as well. And every single day, just before he was sexually abused by his granddad, his grandmother would whip him with a cat of nine tails. And a cat of nine tails is a whip that has lots of strands coming off it. And I actually didn't know that those kinds of whips were called cat of nine tails. So there is a bit of information for you if you didn't know that. But basically these whips are designed to cause the most amount of pain possible. And Larry got whipped with this whip every single day. And then he went down into the basement to be sexually abused by his granddad. But that wasn't his only punishment, no. Larry was also forced to sleep on a wooden floor, cold, hard wooden floor every single night. He didn't have a bed. He was also not allowed the luxury of just going into the fridge. Most of the time, he would actually just go hungry. However, Larry's younger brother, Carl, it was the complete opposite for him. Carl got treated like a little prince. Everyone doted on Carl. Carl was the favorite. He had the most comfortable bed. He was allowed all the food that he wanted. He was never abused. And the two brothers were really pitted against each other. The grandparents definitely made it very clear that Carl was the favorite. And Larry, understandably so, grew up resenting his brother especially. Because as a child, he doesn't realize that it's not his brother's fault, but he obviously thinks like that. And what about Larry's mom? Did she ever stop the abuse? Was she aware of the abuse? And the answer to those questions is yes, she was aware of the abuse. And no, she never tried tried to stop it. In fact, she completely supported the abuse because apparently Larry's own mother despised him. Larry's mom fell pregnant when she was just a teenager with Larry. So she blamed the birth of Larry for ruining her life. It was all Larry's fault, the innocent child. And she resented Larry and she, she didn't care about him. She didn't love him and she supported the abuse of him. And this is another reason why Carl, the younger brother, was the favorite one because she got pregnant with Carl when she was more of a grown up and therefore Carl didn't ruin her life. So one night the abuse towards Larry really came to a head because Larry had fallen ill. He had a fever and he was coughing a lot. He was making a lot of noise because he was coughing and this was really annoying the grandmother. Like how dare this child get ill? How dare this child cough and make noise? So the grandmother made Larry sleep outside. She grabbed Larry by the hair, forced him outside and locked him outside. And I just want to point out that this was in the middle of winter. Larry was only in his pajamas and he literally, and I mean that literally, nearly froze to death. He had to be hospitalized and thankfully he did recover. And this is when Larry's dad found out about the abuse that Larry was going through. And this resulted in Larry being taken out of his mother's care. And now Larry would go on and live with his dad. And this is where Larry would live for the rest of his childhood. So now we skip forward to Larry when he is a young adult. He does join the military, but then he drops out of the military after just 19 days. And then something pretty significant happens when Larry is 19 years old. And that is because he moves back in with his abusive mom. For some reason, he wanted to live with his mom again. 
And Larry spent the whole of his 20s trying to gain his mom's love and approval. He constantly wanted his mom to accept him. And Larry definitely has mommy issues, which I think we can all understand why. But everything that Larry did in his adult life was to try and impress his mom. For example, he went on to get a job as a stockbroker on Wall Street. And I don't know how he managed to get this job because he didn't have a college degree. But Larry, he's definitely very charming. He definitely can worm his way into situations so he actually doesn't surprise me that much but he managed to get this job it was a really good job it paid very well he had lots of money he had access to powerful people and he'd said that he did this he went for this kind of job because he was looking for the respect that he didn't get as a child and he wanted to impress his mom but his mom wasn't impressed. Larry also bought an expensive Mercedes car, again, to impress his mom. He lost a ton of weight, got himself into like really good shape. Again, his mom didn't care about anything. There is literally nothing that he could have done to impress his mom. But Larry's mom, she was never proud of her son, never impressed. She would always just try and belittle Larry. And instead of talking about his achievements, all she would talk about was her own. She saw her son as competition, constantly putting down down what he has achieved and constantly praising herself for what she has achieved. And I kind of think these whole mommy issues and how he's searching for respect kind of is what started off the cult because he was looking for people to respect him. So now we get to the late 80s. Larry is now in his 30s and he settles down and starts his own family. He meets a woman called Teresa and they quickly marry and they go on to have two daughters together. Their eldest daughter, was a girl called Talia, who is very important to today's case, and then a younger daughter called Ava. And it is said that when Larry's children were born, this is when his career really started to take off. And what did Larry do? Well, to be honest, it's so confusing. I don't know what he did. He basically is a professional bullshitter. Like I said, he had a job on Wall Street, managed to talk his way into that, even though he didn't have a college degree. And he loved brown nosing people. Larry was all about who you know, not what you know. He used the opportunity of working on Wall Street to gain some pretty powerful friends. And from his job on Wall Street, he managed to get a job as a financial consultant to very rich and powerful people. And I'm talking very powerful people in powerful positions like politicians business owners, top military officials, and some pretty dodgy people as well. He apparently had contacts in the mafia. Apparently one of the members of the Genovese family, you know who I'm talking about? Apparently one of the members of that mafia family attended his wedding. And Larry made a lot of money being this financial consultant to the rich and powerful. And he expanded his horizons. He opened up his own restaurant. He co-owned a nightclub and money was just pouring in. And then we are now in the mid nineties. And this is when Larry became friends with Rudy Giuliani. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one and only. He was the New York mayor at the time. Mayor, mayor, mayor. So a pretty powerful, influential person to be on your friend list. He also became really good friends with a man called Bernard Carrick. And I didn't know who this person was being from the UK. And if you are from the US, you may know who he is. And if you are from New York, I'm pretty sure you would know who he is because he was apparently the New York police commissioner during 9-11. So he was on TV a lot. He was very obviously important during that time. George Bush, I think actually also recruited him or try to recruit him as Homeland Security. Just know that he was a pretty powerful, prominent person in the police and he had powerful contacts. I mean, he had a contact with George Bush, President George Bush. So these are the kinds of people that Larry is hanging around with. Larry even started consulting for the CIA. He ended up working in Russia at one point as kind of like a consultant for the CIA and with the Cold War that was going on. He even hosted a dinner party for Mikhail Gorbachev, who at that point was the president of the Soviet Union. And I'm just like, what the actual hell? Even one time had a meeting and a meal with Robert De Niro. How is it that he's having dinner with Mikhail Gorbachev? And then next week he's like having dinner with Robert De Niro. Who is this man? How has he managed to talk his way into some of the most powerful rooms on the planet? 
I really don't know, but I think that really sums up Larry Ray for you. He is a smooth talker. And that's all he is. He's all talk. But did Larry's really successful career last long? No, it didn't, unfortunately, because it all came crashing down. Because we are getting into the late 90s now, and Larry was incredibly cocky. He thought that he was invincible. He had made friends in powerful positions, thinking that those friends would protect him. However, that's not how that kind of world works. No, 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 everyone is out for themselves. No one is going to save anyone but themselves. But anyway, Larry, he was incredibly cocky, and he decided to get involved in a mafia financial fraud scheme, which I'm sorry, is never a good idea. He was basically doing like illegal stock trading, insider information, that kind of thing. But then it gets crazier than that because not only is he participating in this fraud scheme with the mafia, Larry also decides to become an FBI informant. And again, I'm like, who the hell is this man? Larry turned FBI informant to inform on the mafia, but Larry was playing both sides. So he was in the fraud scheme with the mafia, making a lot of money from this fraud scheme, but then he was also pretending to be an informant to the FBI, feeding the FBI false information about the mafia fraud scheme. So he was playing both sides. And I'm like, what the hell? Who does that? Who plays both the FBI and mafia? Larry basically turned FBI informant on the mafia because he thought if the mafia got caught in the fraud scheme, that because Larry was a so-called FBI informant, it would save his skin. But again, I think that really does just show you how arrogant Larry Ray is because he thinks that he can get away with playing both the FBI and the mafia. But did his plan work? No, of course it didn't. He got found out. He got found out that he was playing both sides. So Larry was arrested by the FBI and Larry was absolutely panicking. So Larry turned to his powerful friends and politicians, police commissioners and everything like that, begging them to vouch for him. He begged Bernard Carrick to get him out of this situation to talk to the FBI for him. But all of his rich, powerful friends turned their back on Larry Ray because like I said, in that kind of world, there is no such thing as friends. So Larry, in the end, he was forced to take a plea deal and he avoided prison and his sentence was five years probation. But because of this, his life was ruined. His reputation was ruined. And in particular, he grew very resentful of his friend, Bernard Carrick who does come back up later on in this case. But was that the end of Larry's problems? No, because the rest of Larry's life came crashing down as well. Because first of all, Larry had been cheating on his wife. He had been cheating on his wife for a number of years and he had a long-term girlfriend that he kept separate from his family life. And to be honest, he was probably cheating with multiple women, but I just know about this long-term girlfriend because Larry would pimp out his long-term girlfriend. Yeah, I'm not joking. He would offer up his girlfriend to colleagues, politicians, powerful people for them to just have sex with his girlfriend in exchange for favors. And he was doing this so he could get in the good books of these people. And I'm just like, wow, this man is disgusting. And make a note of this, pimping out girlfriends, because this also pops back up later on in this case. But it gets worse because of course it does. Larry was also incredibly abusive to his girlfriend physically and verbally. He would control every element of his girlfriend's life. He would track her movements. And if she ever did something against Larry's rules, there would be serious consequences. And his girlfriend tried to break up with him a number of times, but Larry just sent explicit photos of her to her own parents. And this long-term affair that he was having, it did come to light. And as soon as Larry's wife found out about the affair and what he was doing, she immediately filed for divorce. And this was pretty much at the same time that Larry's career had fallen apart. So every single element of Larry's life has come crashing down. Not only that though, Teresa, the wife, now ex-wife, had full custody of the two children. But the problems did not stop there. Oh no. Because Teresa, the now ex-wife, enters into a relationship with Carl, Larry's brother. 
I know, I know, how messy. And Larry was furious because he hates his brother. And to be honest, it really is messy. Like, why would Teresa do that? Not that I'm blaming her because she's probably been through a lot with Larry, but that is messed up as well. So Larry was so furious that Teresa was now with his brother. Larry blames his brother pretty much for ruining his life as a child, that Larry sets out on a smear campaign of his wife. He wants to tarnish her name, her reputation, ruin her like his life has been ruined. So Larry created websites and blogs and he would post very graphic accusations that Teresa was abusing the children, which was not true, all false. Larry also started to brainwash the children against their own mother. Now, like I said in the intro, Larry is probably one of the scariest, most skilled manipulators I have ever come across. So he was able to brainwash his children, especially the eldest daughter, Talia, very easily. He would tell Talia and her sister, Ava, how much of a terrible human being their mom was, that their mom was abusing them. And Talia especially started to believe her dad. Even though her mom wasn't abusing her, Talia started to believe it. And Talia really started to resent her mom, especially now that her mom was dating her uncle Carl, which to be honest, I can understand why she would resent her mom about that fact because that is messed up. Not as messed up as last week's case, but still messed up. And when Talia confronted her mom about the fact that she didn't like that her mom was now dating her uncle, her mom slapped her in response, which is not okay. And this was kind of the final straw for Talia and she completely cut off her mom and she was in her dad's clutches now. And what did Larry do now that he had complete control over Talia especially? Well, he used it to get back custody. So one day, Larry was over visiting the children at Teresa's home when he just randomly started beating up Teresa in front of the children. And Teresa was so horrified. She was so scared. She immediately called the police. But when the police came out, Larry managed to manipulate the situation and tell the police that it was Teresa abusing him, beating him not the other way round. Larry was playing the victim. And to make it worse, Talia, the daughter, backed him up. She was 15 at the time and Talia made up this whole story to the police that their mom was abusive. It was the mom that was the problem. Talia even told the police that her mom was abusing her and her little sister. An investigation was opened and Larry, for the time being, was given custody of the two girls, which is exactly what he wanted. And over the next few weeks, as this investigation was going on, a load more lies and accusations were being thrown at Teresa. Talia accused her mom of physical abuse, sexual abuse. She also accused her grandfather, her aunt, and her cousin of abusing her as well. However, after more investigation, it was found that these accusations were false. And the police spoke to the youngest child, Ava, about these accusations. Ava was asked if her mom had ever laid a finger on her or her older sister, Talia. And Ava said, no, those are just the lies that daddy tells us to say. So in the end, the police realized that this was all just manipulation and brainwashing and Larry's story was complete BS. And he was ordered to give the children back over to Teresa, the mom, who now did have full custody of the children, but Larry refused. And because he refused to hand the children back, he was technically kidnapping them. And because of this, because he was on parole and because he was technically kidnapping children, he was sent to prison for six months. And what happened to the two children? Well, Ava went back to live with her mom but Talia hated her mom. She truly believed the lies that her dad had been feeding her. So Talia refused to go back and live with her mom. So for the rest of her teenage years, until she went to college, Talia was living in youth shelters. So now we skip forward to 2010. Over the last few years, Larry has been in and out of prison. There was one occasion where he pinned a girlfriend down and tried to suffocate her. On another occasion, he violated his parole. He went AWOL and became an FBI fugitive. So yes, we now skip forward to 2010 and Larry is released from prison for the final time for now. And Larry was about to be reunited with his loyal daughter, Talia, who was now studying at college. And this is where the cult 
of today's case really begins. So Talia was enrolled at the Sarah Lawrence College, which is just on the outskirts of New York City. And Sarah Lawrence College, it's a very small college and it's described as like liberal arts, like that's its focus. It has been described as a quote, whimsical college, however you want to interpret that. I think it's just really focused on arts. And throughout Talia's first year at college, she made a load of friends. She was very confident, very outspoken. And out of her friends, she was almost like the group leader. And there was one subject in particular that Talia liked to talk about more than anything else. And that was her dad, Larry. Talia would talk about her dad at every opportunity. Every conversation would always lead back around to Larry. And Talia would tell her friends, anyone that would listen, that her dad was the most amazing dad in the whole world, that he worked on Wall Street, he had all of these powerful friends, he was in contact with a lot of powerful people, and he was currently in prison wrongfully so. And Talia's friends were really impressed because Talia would sing his praises. Talia had told her friends that her dad had been framed by the government, which is why he was in prison. And Talia painted her dad as this one man trying to take on the government. He is the good guy and the government is squishing him. So in the fall of 2010, Talia is about to enroll in her sophomore year at college and her and her group of friends found a dorm on the college campus to stay in. And then just after the first semester of sophomore year, this is when Larry calls up Talia and tells her that he is being released from prison and he needs somewhere to stay. So Talia, because she is so enamored by her dad, immediately offers up her college dorm. She's like, dad, come and stay with me. We have plenty of room. My friends won't mind. And obviously this is pretty weird. Like it's weird for a parent to go and stay with their child at college with a load of other college kids. But Talia's roommates, they didn't seem to mind. Because Talia talked about her dad so much, her roommates almost felt like they knew him. And I also think that they thought that it was temporary, like he would just stay on the sofa for a week max, and then he would be gone. So Larry moves into this college dorm with Talia and all of her friends, and he makes himself comfortable. He stays on the sofa in the communal area, and he pretty much takes over. And it's just so weird. This dad staying in the communal area, in like the living room area, on the sofa, watching TV with his daughter and all of her college friends. It's just weird. I know when I was in university, I would not be happy if I was in that situation. And now we need to talk about the other students that Larry has just moved in with, Talia's friends, because most of them would go on to be brainwashed and manipulated by Larry into joining his cult. So there were eight students living together in a two-story apartment building. I don't really know what you want to call it, but whatever, it's two story and they're all approximately 19 years old. So we have Talia, Isabella, Claudia and Juliana. And then we have Santos, Gabe, Max and Dan. So Larry moved in with no intention of moving out. This was not temporary for Larry. And he just completely took over. The one thing that he liked to talk about more than anything else was himself. He would basically talk to all of these college students about how amazing he was, that he had worked with the government, with the CIA, that he was a negotiator between the Russian government and the American government in the Cold War, and he was instrumental in setting up meetings. And the students were impressed because they were like, oh my God, this really powerful, important person is living with us. I mean, he has seen the world. Larry also did a lot of the cleaning of the apartment, a lot of the cooking. He bought groceries. He took the students out for meals. The students were actually eating decent food. Larry was paying for everything, which made the group grateful for Larry. So even though it was kind of weird that Talia's dad was sleeping on the sofa, he was doing so much for them that they were grateful. And of course, that was all on purpose. Larry wanted to manipulate his way in, make them all grateful for him before he brainwashed them. Because things were not sunshines and rainbows for long. Because as soon as Larry got his foot in the door, that was when his mind games began. And oh my God, his manipulation, his brainwashing, all of his games have devastating consequences. Like I said, this case is insane. It is 
truly unbelievable what goes on to happen in today's case. So because all of these students were fascinated with him, they would hang off his every word. Larry would start to fill their heads with a load of lies. He started talking about how the government were out to get him, that his life was in danger, the government wanted to kill him, that is why he was in prison after all. Larry told all of the students that after working with the CIA, Larry knew a load of secrets about 9-11. And because Larry knew these secrets, that made Larry dangerous. And that put a target on Larry's back. So powerful people wanted to silence Larry. So Larry would sometimes just be out and about living his life and he would notice a car following him. There was even one time where a person in this car shot at him. Missed him, of course, because it's fake. But this person, they shot at him and his life was truly in danger. And remember Bernard Carrick, the police commissioner from 9-11, the one that I said would come up again? Larry was obsessed with this man. He would say over and over that Bernard Carrick was out to get him, that he was behind all of this. Bernard had completely screwed him over. He thought that Bernard was his friend. And now he wanted to destroy Larry. And apparently there was lots of other very powerful people involved. For example, Rudy Giuliani also wanted to take Larry out. Even President George Bush wanted Larry dead, as well as Vice President Dick Cheney, who was working with his ex-wife, Teresa. How does anyone believe this? How? Because everything that I've just said is obviously a load of lies. Larry Ray, even though in his head he thinks that he's important, he's not. I'm sorry. W why would an ex-president want him dead? Like, for what? Larry hasn't done anything in his life, let's be realistic. He has serious main character syndrome. Because I know that there are pictures out there of Larry Ray with powerful people. There are pictures out there of Larry with Gorbachev. But Larry is the kind of person that is able to smooth talk his way into powerful rooms, see a camera come out, and then all of a sudden insert himself into that picture. He's one of those kinds of people. He hasn't really actually done anything. So all of these students, they're hanging on his every word because Larry has these pictures of himself with powerful people. So of course, all of his stories are true. And because Larry has had dealings with Wall Street and the FBI and stuff, only loosely, but he has had dealings with them. He has letters, for example, from the FBI. So Larry pulls out these letters as more evidence of all of his stories. And Tanya, she is completely brainwashed by her dad, backs him up on everything. So Larry almost became this messiah to this group of college kids. He was this incredibly powerful, intelligent man that was going up against the government. He was fighting the people's cause, whatever that was. So Larry, he won the trust and respect of these college kids. And that was all he needed. Larry started lecturing all of the college students in this dorm. Every single day, all of the college students, they had to gather in the communal area, in the living room, and Larry would lecture them. He would lecture them on things like truth and justice, the nature of the universe, the sun, the stars, the planets, religion, you know, all the usual cult stuff. And the students were eating up every word he was saying. And one by one, Larry started taking the students on their own for individual one-on-one -on -one lectures. He started giving the students personal therapy and coaching. And this is seriously when the cult begins and it truly baffles me how nobody seemed to notice that they're pretty much in a cult right now. And it's like, this man is not qualified to be a therapist. But Larry would say that he learned all the techniques during his time in the CIA. He was taught by the CIA how to discipline the mind, how to unlock more of the mind, how to get past barriers and traumas in your life to unlock your full potential. All of these cult leaders, they have a guidebook. They all have a book that they read and they all do the same bloody thing. So Larry, in these one-on-one -on -one lectures with the students, would teach them about their mental health, their traumas, their sexuality. Because he didn't target all of the students living in this dorm room. He only targeted some. The students that he targeted were struggling with their mental health, easier to manipulate, and they fell right into Larry's clutches. He would tell these students that were lost, looking for guidance, that they were special in their own kind of way. And they needed to work with Larry to unlock 
their full potential. And Larry was the only one that could help them see the light. That they had been brought together by fate. And if they trusted Larry, if they worked with him in these one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions, they would unlock true happiness and confidence. And the first person that Larry really concentrated on was Isabella. And Isabella is very, very, very significant to today's case. First of all, Larry seemed to have a thing for Isabella. Mm -hmm. And we all know what I'm talking about here. From the moment he laid eyes on Isabella, he was like, yes, that is the one that I want. And I do mean in a sexual way. So Isabella had come to Sarah Lawrence College on a full scholarship. She had previously gone to an all girls Catholic school and she had lived a very sheltered life. And just before Larry moved in with everyone, she had gone through a pretty bad breakup with a boyfriend and she was struggling. She was very low. She didn't have a lot of confidence. She kind of kept herself to herself. And then Larry moved in and Larry started showing her attention. And this attention from Larry apparently lifted her out of a very dark place. So in these one-on-one -on -one sessions that Larry was having with Isabella, Isabella poured her heart out to Larry. She told Larry her deepest, darkest secrets, all of her struggles, and Larry completely took advantage of this. It was very predatory. He started taking Isabella into her bedroom for these one-on-one -on -one sessions. He would make her lie down on her bed. He would cuddle up to her. He would stroke her hair. He would start whispering in her ear, don't worry, don't worry, no one is going to harm my baby girl. And it is just so creepy. And he's like 50 years old at this point. I haven't actually said his age, have I? He's 50 years old. And this is a 19 year old girl, the same age as his daughter, who is literally in the next room. But it gets worse. It gets worse because Larry started telling everyone that Isabella needed extra sessions, that she was incredibly broken, and that Larry needed to start spending the night in her room. He told everyone that he was sleeping on the floor. It was all PG. But did he stay on the floor for long? No. Larry soon found his way into Isabella's bed. And it wasn't long until he started a sexual relationship with this 19 year old college student. And it just makes me so angry because I know Isabella is 19. She is old enough to make her own decisions, old enough to consent, but she's so vulnerable right now. And Larry is so manipulative. He's so skilled at brainwashing. It's grooming. It really, really is. That is what he's doing. But it gets worse for Isabella, it does. Because Larry convinced Isabella to cut off her family like true cult style. And how did he do this? How did he convince Isabella to cut off all her friends, family, everyone? Well, Larry is so skilled at brainwashing that he managed to brainwash Isabella into thinking that she was sexually abused as a child by a family member when she wasn't. And that is just crazy to me. And when Isabella's family phoned her up to ask her, is she coming back home for winter break or whatever? Larry was the one that actually spoke on the phone to Isabella's family and said, no, Isabella won't be coming home because she was sexually abused as a child and it's your fault. And if Isabella comes home for winter break, if she is around her family, Isabella will commit suicide. Yeah, Larry actually said that to Isabella's mom. And Isabella's mom was beside herself because obviously she was concerned about her daughter, but she didn't want her daughter to come back home if her daughter was going to commit suicide. So instead of going home for winter break, like all of the other students, Isabella spent winter break at Larry's apartment with Larry and Talia. How is Talia okay with this? I mean, again, she has been brainwashed. But Larry and Isabella are sharing a bed every single night, having sex, and Talia is in the next room. So then Larry, Isabella, and Talia, and all of the students, they return after winter break. And I'm just like, Larry, you have your own apartment. Why are you still living with all of these college kids? I mean, the apartment situation is actually very confusing. The apartment doesn't belong to Larry. It belongs to one of Larry's friends that he has also manipulated and brainwashed. It's all very complicated. But anyway, all of the college kids, Larry, everyone, they're back on campus. And now Larry pretty much goes around and picks off the students one by one because he's gotten Isabella and he needs more. So the next student that was Larry's target 
was Claudia. Claudia had also grown up in California. She was incredibly close with her friend. She was very smart, creative, independent. But Claudia, she was suffering with depression. And Larry saw this and pounced. Larry said that he could help Claudia with her mental health, help her gain confidence, beat depression, but she had to participate in the one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions. And as soon as Claudia started having these one-on-one -on -one sessions with Larry, she did turn into a completely different person. She did become confident. She did become happy. And people have actually said that there was this like artificial happiness around Claudia. She was just like an empty shell with like a creepy smile on her face. Do you know what I mean? And it's just so sad. I just hate Larry so much. I really do. He has destroyed so many lives and we are only just beginning. And then randomly, Claudia started telling everybody that she had schizophrenia and it was Larry that was the one that diagnosed her with schizophrenia, even though he has no medical training. And I don't know why he decided to do this. Like, I, I really don't know what his objective is here. But Claudia became really close with Larry because she felt like Larry had turned her life around. So then just like that, Larry now has his third member of the cult. He has the original member Talia, Isabella, and now Claudia. So now Larry turns his sights onto the next student, which was Santos. Santos had grown up in the Bronx and he had two sisters who do appear in today's case, but not right now. And Santos, like Claudia, had been struggling with his mental health and he was struggling with depression. And because he saw how much of a positive impact Larry had had on both Claudia and Isabella, he started taking one-on-one -on -one sessions with Larry. And soon Larry wrapped Santos around his little finger because Santos started pouring his heart out, all of his vulnerabilities to Larry. He told Larry that he had tried to take his own life in high school and he was struggling again. And Santos turned to Larry because he thought that Larry was experienced in the world, that he could help him. And it was also around this time when Santos entered into a relationship with Talia. So obviously this made Santos trust Larry even more. So Santos is now in the cult. And then finally, from the college students, we have Dan. Now Dan, currently in his sophomore year, his relationship with his girlfriend was currently not in a great place. He was also struggling with his sexuality and he just felt a bit lost. And this is when Claudia and Santos convinced Dan to talk to Larry because Larry can fix everything. So Dan started talking to Larry and Dan expressed that he was struggling with his sexuality. And guess what Larry said? Larry said to Dan, oh, don't worry, you're not gay. I can tell you that for sure. And that was that. Dan just took Larry's word for it. Dan almost felt a sense of relief because Dan had struggled with his sexuality and now he finally had an answer. And that was all it took for now Dan to join the cult. And I just want to stress here that all of the students that have joined the cult they don't realize that they have joined the cult. So now we skip forward to the end of sophomore year. Larry still has all of the students that we have spoken about under his thumb. He has complete control over all of them. He's still giving his daily lectures about religion, sexuality, spiritual awakenings, and all of that. And he was still sleeping with Isabella. And it's obviously the end of the year. Normally students return home. But was that the case for these students in this cult? No, because the four students, Claudia, Isabella, Dan and Santos, and obviously Talia, but she's his daughter, so it kind of doesn't really count for her. Larry convinces all four of those students to stay with him over the summer in his apartment, which was located in New York City. And unfortunately, their lives would never be the same again after this summer because Larry's cult now goes into overdrive. The four students plus Talia move into the apartment located in Manhattan and they truly thought that they were doing this on their own will, but they weren't. They all thought that they were going to have a really good, fun summer living with their friends in New York City. They don't realize that they have been completely brainwashed by by Larry and they're about to have a summer from hell. Because from day one of living in this apartment, the students, they had no control over their lives. They had no say. They now were living completely under Larry's rule. Every morning, the students were woken up very early by the same song every day. They were then forced to do push-ups every morning. And each day, 
the amount of push-ups that they had to do increased. He truly thought that it was like a military boot camp because he would tell people, oh, I've been in the military. What he would fail to tell them is that he was only in the military for 19 days. He would make the five college kids sit through hours of his lectures about his bullshit. He really loves the sound of his own voice. And it must have been such a strange experience for these students living in this apartment because there's six of them living in this apartment and it was only a one bedroom apartment and Larry and Isabella of course got the bedroom and the rest of the kids were in the living room. And it was not the biggest apartment, it was pretty small. So with six people living there with all of their belongings, it was a mess. Their stuff was everywhere. There was basically nowhere to move. I don't know how six people stayed in this apartment and I don't know how four people slept in the living room. On top of this, Larry also removed the locks and the door handles from the bathroom so no one had any privacy either. Larry also made everyone go on a strict diet so they could all lose weight, which would quote, cleanse their minds. Larry also placed locks on the fridge and the freezer so no one could steal food. Everyone was starving, couldn't concentrate, which made them easier to manipulate and control. And then in true cult fashion, Larry decided to drug everyone. Yes, so he had more control over them. Typical cult leader, he pumped the five students, or maybe he just did four of them. I don't actually know exactly what he did to Talia. She obviously was subjected to the cult-like atmosphere, but I don't actually know if he drugged her or not. I wouldn't put it past him. But anyway, Larry got a load of amphetamines and he basically made everyone take them because again, the drugs would cleanse their mind, allow them to see the light. But what it actually did is cause severe anxiety, sleep deprivation, and paranoia. All things that played into Larry's hands. And once Larry had them all in this anxious, paranoid state, he would make them all sit in the living room for interrogations. And I truly mean that. He would get one student at a time, sit them in the middle of the room, and Larry would hound them with question after question after question, making them reveal their deepest, darkest secrets, their fantasies, their wants and their needs in life about their sexuality. He would quiz them on their childhoods, on their trauma, what they have gone through. And everything bad that has ever happened to any of these kids, Larry convinced them that it was because of their parents. And if Larry didn't think that their trauma was bad enough, Larry would keep goading the student like over and over. Are you sure that that is all you have gone through? Are you sure that there are not suppressed memories? Are you sure you haven't been abused, sexually abused? He would keep telling whatever student he was interrogating, think harder. I think you've been through more than what you're letting on. I think you've been through worse. And in the end, some of the students would actually make up trauma to satisfy Larry. And then Larry would brainwash them into thinking that their made up trauma was actually real. It is crazy. And because of these interrogation sessions, because all of the students were convinced that everything bad in their lives led back to their parents, they all cut their family off. They didn't socialize with anyone but the cult and Larry. Again, classic cult. And by the time summer is over and the students need to go back to college for their junior year, normally students move back to campus or live near the college. Larry convinced all of the students to carry on living with him in this apartment and then they would have to commute back and forth from Manhattan to the Sarah Lawrence College. So throughout their junior year, all of these students were living in Larry's apartment. They would commute to college, go to their lectures, and then they would come straight back. So Larry now had these students trapped in this apartment and he completely used this to his advantage. He completely broke each student individually. And I mean completely break them apart, completely take away their willpower, their hope, everything. And he did this using a variety of techniques, but one of the main techniques that he used in true cult fashion was sex. So we already know that he is sleeping with Isabella. Well, now Larry turns his attention to 
two other cult members, and that is Claudia and Dan. He started off with Claudia, who was incredibly insecure with her own body. She wasn't sexually confident, and she told Larry about this, and he completely took advantage of her. He started preaching to everybody that if they were more open sexually, that would mean that you were more honest with yourself. And every night at the dinner table, and this bit makes me feel sick, he would gently touch Claudia all over her body so she could become comfortable with her body. And he told Claudia that he could, quote, make her orgasm without touching her. And then this next bit is incredibly distressing. So there was just one night where he bent Claudia over and inserted his fingers inside of her without her consent, so sexually assaulting her. And then it wasn't long until Larry was also having sex with Claudia and Isabella. And that is bad enough anyway, but Talia, his daughter, is also living in this apartment. So that was Claudia. And now he turns his attention on to Dan. So if you remember, Dan had been struggling with his sexuality. And he told Larry this, but Larry said to him, you're not gay, I know you're not. And Larry decides that Dan needs sex education lessons. So one night, Larry instructed Isabella, who was at this point his puppet. Like Isabella was completely under his spell. She basically had no mind of her own. So Larry one night instructed Isabella to go out into the living room, which is where Dan would sleep. And he instructed Isabella to go and have sex with Dan. So Isabella went out, she started kissing Dan, and they had sex. And after she'd had sex with Dan, she just walked back into the bedroom and went and had sex with Larry. And I don't even know if Dan was okay with this. Like, was this his consent? Was Isabella okay with this? It's just so sick and twisted and messed up. However, every night from this moment onwards, Isabella would go and collect Dan and take him into the bedroom where Larry and Isabella were. And Dan and Isabella would engage in sexual activity. And Larry would stand there at the side of the bed watching, sometimes giving instructions like move this way or do that. And also in these sessions, Larry would also make Isabella and Dan watch porn to get instructions on how to have sex. And then eventually it turned into Larry joining in. So now Larry is having threesomes with Isabella and Dan. And I think we all just need to remind ourselves here that Larry is 50 or 51 at this point. And these are young college students around the age of 20. And his 20 year old daughter is in the next room asleep on the sofa. It's just so messed up. But did it stop there? No, of course it didn't, because now Larry wanted Dan and Claudia to start having sex with one another. And I wouldn't be surprised if Larry also joined in that as well, and Dan, Claudia, and Larry were also having threesomes. And then Isabella probably joined in. And it's just so sick. It's like, how much of this are they actually consenting to? There was a time as well where Dan and Claudia had to go on a trip with their college. They actually went to study for a short period of time in London. So they had to leave the apartment. I'm surprised that Larry even allowed them. But even when they were in London, Larry was controlling their every move, especially sexually. He would make Claudia and Dan get on Skype and he would make them have sex on Skype in front of him whilst he was watching and instructing. And also whilst they're in London, Larry made Claudia go out and have sex with random strangers against her own will for Larry's sick and twisted kicks. And then when they were back in the apartment, there was one more very sexually degrading thing that happened to Dan. So Dan was still struggling with his sexuality and he clearly expressed that to Larry. And Larry was like, oh, okay, you're gay. Isabella, go get one of your dresses. So Isabella went and got one of her dresses and Larry made Dan wear one of these dresses. Larry then instructed Isabella to go and get all of her sex toys. Larry instructed Dan to pick up the biggest dildo and he forced Dan to put the dildo in his mouth. And Larry said, do you like that? Do you like the feeling of that in your mouth? And then afterwards, Larry instructed Dan to penetrate himself with the dildo. And Dan followed his command. He was there in Isabella's dress with this sex toy. And it was incredibly degrading and traumatizing to Dan. And it was also Larry could control him and humiliate him. And at this point, the cult had been going on for about a year. And this is when a couple more very significant people join the cult. 
So you may remember, you may not, but Santos has two sisters. His two sisters were Yalitza and Felicia, and the two of them end up joining the cult. So Yalitza, she was in a very vulnerable situation. She was struggling with her mental health. I think she was in a very similar situation to Santos before he joined the cult. And Santos kept saying to Yalitza how amazing Larry was and how he'd helped him turn his life around. And Yalitza was looking for a change. She was looking for something or someone to help her. And Yalitza thought that Larry was that person. So Yalitza arrived at the apartment and pretty much moved in straight away because she thought Larry could help her like he has helped her brother. So that is how Yalitza joined the cult. However, Felicia was a little bit different. Felicia was a Harvard graduate. She was a Columbia graduate. She was just finishing up her medical degree. She was actually living in California, about to start a placement for her like hospital training. She was confident. She had a huge group of friends. She was very happy, bubbly. She had everything going for her. Felicia is not the typical victim that Larry goes for. But when Felicia visits Santos and Yalitza one time, when she flies from California to New York, we know how Larry is. As soon as he laid his eyes on Felicia, just like Isabella, he knew that he wanted her. But he had to go about it in a slightly different way because Felicia, she was independent. She was going to be a doctor. She was just about to start her job. California, she's in a different state, not as easy to control. So Larry had to bide his time with Felicia. He had to woo her. Every time Felicia would come and visit in New York, Larry rolled out the red carpet. He would buy her gifts, flowers, really expensive gifts. He would take her to expensive restaurants. They would stay in fancy hotels. And they kind of started dating. And Larry was the nicest boyfriend in the world, attentive, caring, showering her with gifts and compliments, always being there for her. So now Larry had his claws in because Felicia thought that he was the most incredible man that she had ever met. She was so lucky to even know him. And now Felicia trusts him. So Larry started telling her about the fact that the government was out to get him. That all of these powerful people would follow him that have fired shots at him. And now, because Felicia is his girlfriend, she was in danger as well. People were in California, where she lived, where she worked. There were people out to get her, to kill her, to harm her, just because she is associated with Larry. But not just that. Larry convinced Felicia that her own parents were involved. That Felicia's own parents were in this huge plot to kill Felicia and Larry. And for some strange reason, Felicia believed it. And Larry said that he could only protect her if she moved to New York and lived with him in his apartment. And this breakdown of Felicia is actually really, really sad. She went from an independent, strong woman, so confident, had everything going for her. She was about to start her dream job and Larry completely destroys Felicia and she becomes a shell of her former self. She is now incredibly anxious, paranoid. Larry is probably giving her drugs and Felicia is truly, utterly scared for her life. It is just scary to see that Felicia, she is not your quote unquote typical victim of a cult. It's just scary. It truly is terrifying how good Larry is at manipulating people and brainwashing them and completely altering their reality. I mean, I feel sorry for everyone in the cult. I really do. But I feel so sorry for the parents of Santos, Yalitza and Felicia because all three of their children have been sucked in and brainwashed by Larry. But Larry has also turned all of their children against them. And all three of the children, Santos, has already cut them off. But now Yalitza and Felicia also cut their parents off as well. So now Larry's cult has grown. There is now eight of them in this cult. And he has set his sights on Felicia from day one. So he now officially makes Felicia his second girlfriend because obviously Isabella is his first girlfriend. And of course, he enters into a sexual relationship with Felicia as well. Because, you know, true cult cult leader fashion has to have multiple partners. He actually starts calling Felicia and Isabella his two wives. So now every single night, Felicia and Isabella would sleep in the bed with him and they all had to be naked. That was a rule, of course. And then what is just really, really disgusting and just 
oh, it makes my skin crawl, is that Isabella was made to sleep with her arm draped over Larry's naked body and she was forced to cup his genitals. Yeah, she had to have her hand like right up there and cupping them and uh, she had to sleep like that every night. Why? Just why? And of course they were having threesomes, but that was probably a given. I probably didn't even need to say that. But it gets worse. It really does. Of course it does. I mean, it's a cult. Because Larry now starts to pimp out Felicia. Yeah, remember he did this right at the beginning of this story. He pimped out his girlfriend that he was having an affair with, with his wife. He would force Felicia to go out onto the streets and have sex with strangers. And this wasn't sex work or anything like that. She wasn't getting paid. Larry would just make her go and have sex with strangers and he would watch, he would sometimes record and he would just watch and get his fix. And then he would also force Felicia to go to a shopping mall, for example, with a short skirt on and no underwear and just flash people. And I don't know why he was forcing her to do this, but he would force her to do this pretty much every week. And then because he was recording her having sex with strangers, he would also hang this over her head and threaten to release the footage if she ever disobeyed. So that was how Larry was using sex to control and manipulate his cult followers. However, there were two more things that Larry would do to control his cult followers, and that was through money and violence. So we'll start off with the money because it turns out that Larry Ray, his full-time job was being a cult leader. And uh, that doesn't exactly pay very well, does it? So he needed some money. And his solution was to extort his cult followers. And how did he do this? Well, he managed to convince his cult followers that they were damaging his property. Even though they weren't, he would go around the apartment and inspect on a daily basis. And if there was a new mark on the wall, or if one of the kitchen pans had been scratched, any kind of damage, he would blame it on one of his followers and he would make them pay for the damage that they hadn't done. Every single night, Larry would gather everyone in a circle and he would make the students confess to the damage that they had caused. And obviously because the students, they weren't damaging the apartment, at least they weren't intentionally damaging the apartment, the interrogation would start off with whatever student was being interrogated saying, oh, I didn't do anything, I'm, I'm, I'm innocent, I haven't done anything. But then Larry would keep getting more and more angry and he would say, you're lying, you're lying, you need to confess to what you have done. And eventually the students, they would break down and they would start confessing to damage that they have done, but they didn't do it. But they were just confessing that they had done it to shut Larry up. And then as soon as they would confess, Larry would charge them an extortionate amount of money to repair the damage. And there is actually a video online of Claudia in this like confession circle and she's in the hot seat and Larry is interrogating her about damage that she has apparently done. And it's an incredibly distressing video to watch. You're on video now, go ahead. Tell the world why you wanna just feel sorry and sad. I don't want to. Go ahead. And how you just destroy things and damage everybody. So look at you crying. Fine, Why are you crying, Claudia? I don't want to. Why are you trying to ruin my website business? I'm not trying to ruin your website well, business. Then, well, then what were you doing? I was damaging it by not telling you and doing what you asked me explicitly not to do. And so that's not ruining it? I was not trying to. But if you're trying to damage it and do, then aren't you doing that? Yes. So you're just a liar? And I actually haven't mentioned this yet, but Larry records everything. There is so much video footage of Larry online. Every interrogation session, every lecture, every meeting, every one-on-one -on -one session, everything is recorded in that apartment. Love you. you want me to stop? I'll stop. That's I don't want you to stop. Problem. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't want you to stop. I'm not going to keep wasting my time like this. Okay, yeah. Let's go. You can tell me, baby. Tell me. Spit it out. Impress me. They don't have anything to say besides, besides that. It is 9 55 p.m. Can you tell me anything else about the conversations or meetings for non care? Well, we talked about, about you and like how we wanted to like bring you down and like, like that you were dangerous to, to him and like that you. What do you mean you don't know what to do? I don't know how to. I don't fix everything. I don't fix what things? I don't fix. I don't, 
I can't help you or understand what you're talking about unless you explain it to me. Like, help you finish with this, and then... Well, you could not interfere. That would be a good start. Yeah. Hey, Larry. I'm getting candid video. Oh, honey. <laughs> Your ornament. What do you mean, disco days? Disco lives. Oh my God, disco's dead. I want to put on Tinkerbell. I've been asking you to stop breaking stuff and stop hurting me and attacking me physically, and you refuse. Get out of my garage. Gloria, you did tell the truth. That actually was helpful. And you can see Claudia in this footage. You can just see how broken she is. And Larry did this to all of them. Santos, Dan, Yelitsa, Felicia. He did it to all of them. And Larry would give the students itemized bills for them to repay him for the damage that they have caused. And these were astronomical amounts of money that he was charging to repair things that weren't even broken. And these bills would add up to thousands of dollars. Santos received a bill, an itemized bill of everything that he has damaged for $50,000. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're not talking like a couple of hundred dollars, no, $50,000, but it gets worse. Felicia received a bill of $160,000. And you might be thinking, what the hell did Felicia apparently damage that cost $160,000? Well, Larry accused Felicia of stealing all of his money from his credit cards, which was complete BS. She never even touched his credit cards. But the students, they were convinced and brainwashed into thinking that they had done all of this damage and that they needed to pay him back. So Santos and Felicia, they're in a lot of debt to Larry. They ended up running back to their parents that they had cut off, asking them for money, saying that they owed Larry all of this money and if they didn't give them the money, they would kill themselves. So Santos and Felicia's parents, they handed over $200,000 to their children so they could pay off their debts, all of which went straight to Larry. So that was the money side of things and Larry did that all the time. That is how he was making money. But then he also used violence to control his followers. And I need to warn you now, things do get incredibly distressing to listen to, even though they already have been. So the followers, if they ever stepped out of line, if they ever broke a rule that they didn't even know existed, if they ever upset set Larry in any kind of way, they would be physically punished. Larry would punch his followers in the face, in the legs, in the arms, in the stomach. He would place them in chokeholds until they would pass out. There was a time where Dan had apparently damaged the oven and he made Dan kneel in front of him and Larry was holding a knife and Larry threatened to dismember Dan. Larry in particular really liked to abuse Felicia and there is a video of him doing this online and I was truly shocked by this video. I couldn't actually believe what I was watching. Ah! 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 I want to go to that shit. Can you calm down? I love you, Larry! Calm down. Please get off of me! Please! You hurt yourself or hurt Please! Me. Love you, Larry! Oh, yeah. And it's just so distressing. And you can see Felicia, she's completely broken and he's slapping her face, he's punching her. He throws her to the ground. He has his hands around her neck and he places his knee on her back, like holding her on the floor. He loved to tie Felicia's legs together with zip ties, place duct tape over her mouth. Larry would also love to humiliate Felicia. He would always call her a baby and say that she needed a pacifier. He also one time told Isabella to buy a load of diapers and he made Felicia wear an adult diaper diaper and nothing else. And Felicia was made to wear this adult diaper in the living room with no other clothes on and watch children's TV shows. Larry also seemed to have it in for Santos as well. And Santos believes it's because he committed the one sin of dating his daughter, Talia. And Santos and Talia, I don't really know what happened with their relationship. They briefly dated, but they weren't together at this point in the cult. But yeah, Larry seemed to have it out for Santos as well. To be honest, Larry has it out for everyone because he also has it out for Dan, which you will come to find out in a minute. But there was one time where Larry was beating Santos with a hammer. And there is actually a 
another person in the cult. But we don't know too much information about them, which is why I haven't really brought them up. But there is another member of this cult called Ivan, and he's actually an ex-boyfriend of Talia's. And he would also come round to the apartment occasionally. He didn't live there, so maybe that's why we don't know much information about him. But he would also come around the apartment and Larry would absolutely beat him black and blue. He was apparently close to Larry when he was younger and Larry took him under his wing. And it's, yeah, it's just another person that Larry completely destroys. And then Larry definitely saved the worst violence for Dan. And why did Larry have it out for Dan? Well, that was because of Talia. So Talia was supposed to apply to Stanford Law School, but she missed the deadline. And Larry blamed Dan for Talia missing the deadline. Even though Dan has nothing to do with it, Larry seemed to get it in his head that Dan was out for Talia. And even though Dan said that he wasn't responsible, like he wasn't sabotaging Talia, he wasn't jealous of her, blah, blah, blah. Larry didn't care. And what Larry did to Dan in response to Dan sabotaging his daughter is one of the most extreme degrading reactions I have ever heard. Larry got a piece of tinfoil and made. It was described as like a noose, but it was like a mini noose. And he placed this essentially just a ring, a tinfoil ring around Dan's testicles and penis. And he began to squeeze that ring around Dan's genitals. And he kept twisting and squeezing this tinfoil around Dan's genitals and it was cutting into him. Because we all know foil, tin foil, aluminum foil, whatever you want to call it, it's sharp. And he was making it tighter and tighter and it was excruciating pain. Dan was bleeding. He was cutting off the circulation to Dan's genitals. And the whole time Larry was just saying, confess, confess. And Dan didn't know what he was supposed to be confessing to. And Dan was confessing to things left, right and center. Things were just coming out of his mouth, but Larry never liked his response. So every time Larry didn't like a response, he was squeezing harder and harder. And eventually he let Dan go. But this man, Larry Ray is absolutely insane. But that wasn't the only incident involving Dan. A few days later, Larry took a pair of pliers, forced them into Dan's mouth and clamped them down on Dan's tongue. Again, there is a video of this happening. I have seen this video and I could not believe my eyes when I was seeing it. It just didn't seem real. I felt like I was in the twilight zone. I can't believe that Larry actually did this to a human being and recorded it. And Larry has these metal pliers in Dan's mouth on his tongue and he is pressing down and down, threatening to rip Dan's tongue out. They don't know the facts. I know them, dickhead. Dan is unable to speak and at the same same time this is happening, Larry is also holding a mallet, threatening to beat Dan. And Larry just keeps saying, I'll bust your face in right now. The next thing that's going to be out is your dick and balls. Bust your face right here. Next thing that's going to be out is your dick and balls. Larry also said, quote, did you like the other night when your balls were getting strangulated? And Dan just stood there taking all of this because what else is he supposed to do? Larry eventually took the pliers out of Dan's mouth and then he just started to beat him with a mallet. Now one more time and I'm going to put your tongue in here. Do you understand me? But thankfully, Hopefully, from this incident, something good did come about because Dan finally had enough. And because of this incident, Dan got the courage to finally leave the cult. Dan was the first person to escape this cult. And unfortunately, it would take a long time before another person did. Now we get to 2013. This is approximately three years after Larry first met all of the students when he first moved in. And a few things happen at the same time. First of all, all of the students graduate apart from Santos, who failed his degree because of Larry's mind games. But Talia, Isabella and Claudia they all graduate and Larry is there at their graduation in the audience acting all proud. And then you would think, okay, they've graduated. Surely this cult ends. They go their separate ways. But no, he convinces them all to leave his apartment in New York and move with him to North Carolina to his stepdad's home. So the cult just keeps on going. All seven of them go to North Carolina. So we have Larry, Talia, Isabella, Claudia, Yalitza, Santos, and Felicia. And they all move into Larry's stepdad's home, but Larry's stepdad doesn't live there right now. So they have the house to themselves. And Larry puts them straight to work doing grueling renovations. 
I want that fucking shit cleaned up in the pole barn. I want everything in here, including these big boxers, moved today. Okay. And Larry's mind games just continue. So since Dan has left the cult, Larry is incredibly paranoid that another one of his members are also going to leave. So he pits them against one another. He splits the cult into two groups, his favorite people and the bad people. Over in his favorite people cult, he has his daughter Talia, Isabella and Felicia, his two wives. And then over in the bad people cult, we have Santa. Claudia and Yalitza. And somehow Larry manages to convince Felicia that her two siblings, so Santos and Yalitza, over in the bad people cult, are trying to poison her and have been poisoning her for the last three years trying to kill her. Larry also convinces Felicia that her parents were poisoning her as a child. And there are video clips of Felicia just breaking down in tears, accusing her siblings of poisoning her, saying that her parents have been poisoning her. Why are you terrible? Because I'm afraid because the people like in California, they told me that if I didn't do what they wanted me to do, they were going to send people to kill me. It was people that my parents have known them for a long time, like Carrie introduced them to my parents. Um, it's true what you're making. No, I'm not making it up, I swear. I'm afraid, Larry, I'm so scared. Okay. You I'm know that they would hurt you, you really- Yes, I'm, I am so certain. I know okay. that in the deepest, like, I know that deep down, I know that they will kill me. They will kill me. Your parents? Yes, my parents will kill me or they'll send like people like Derek knows to kill me. I know that. I'm not making it up. I swear to God. Okay. I swear to God. Oh my God, it's a nightmare. And again, they're just incredibly disturbing to see because you can see how distressed Felicia is because she genuinely believes that her siblings are trying to kill her. I've been asking you to stop breaking stuff and stop hurting me and attacking me physically and you refuse. You've wasted two and a half hours. It's not me, Larry. An even more disturbing clip where Felicia again can be seen crying out in mental agony and Santos is standing over her and Santos is trying to get her to calm down, to stop. He's like talking to her, but every time Santos speaks, he slaps himself around the face. Santos, can you give me a little description of what's been going on today? She has not stopped making noise for getting up from the couch for seven hours now. <laughs> Stop me. No! Stop yes, me. I'm done! That's how much you love me? That's how yes! Me. Yes! Yes! Stop me! She Hold on, Dorman's in the hall looking at my doors now. <laughs> he just left. This is your fault. This is your responsibility. Thanks for taking care of me. And it is incredibly disturbing. Like truly, you have Felicia who's like rocking back and forth. She's crying, she's screaming. She's making all kinds of noises. And then Santos, every single word that he says, he slaps himself every time. It's almost like it's a nervous tick that Larry has made him develop that Santos feels like he constantly has to punish himself for even speaking. And there are just so many more video clips that are just so disturbing of very similar things. And as time went on, many of the members tried to take their own life. First there was Yalitza. She swallowed a whole bottle of Tylenol. She was taken to hospital and she was in a coma for days. Claudia also swallowed a whole bottle of Tylenol. She also ended up in hospital. Felicia also tried to take her life multiple times, as did Isabella. There was 12 separate suicide attempts between the four of them. And each time one of them tried to take their own life when they went to hospital, their parents were informed that their child, I mean, yes, they're an adult, but their child was in hospital because of a suicide attempt. But because they had all cut off their parents, the parents were not allowed to see them. Larry always got in the way. And I can't even imagine the worry and panic of those parents not knowing what is going on with their child. At this point, all of the parents did realize that their children were in a cult. And the parents were trying desperately to get their children out of this cult. They did report this cult to the police. The police even went to the North Carolina home to do a welfare check. And when they reported back, all the police said was, well, 
They're all adults. They're acting on free will. There's nothing we can do. And I feel so sorry for the parents of this case. They have not seen or spoken to their children in years, apart from the odd occasion where one of the children crawls back to them to ask for money to pay off their debts to Larry. And unbelievably, this cult carries on like this for the next five years. Mm -hmm. You heard that right. All of this abuse, the mind games, the brainwashing, pretty much throughout the whole of their 20s, from 2013 to 2018, all of the remaining cult members stay in the cult. They move between various houses, but they live completely isolated in this cult with Larry. And at some point during those five years, some of the cult members did manage to leave. First was Santos. He finally found the strength to leave. And then not too long after Santos left, his sister Yalitza also left. And then as for Talia, because I'm not going to lie here, Talia is a little bit of like a weird case when it comes to this cult. She has avoided the extreme abuse from Larry. I mean, of course, she is still a victim. She has still been brainwashed, manipulated from a very young age, but she did escape the main abuse that the other cult members suffered. And Talia also had more freedom than the other members. She did have a life outside of the cult. She did come and go. She didn't always stay with the cult. So it's not really clear when Talia left the cult. Did she ever leave the cult? It's just not entirely clear. But at this point during those five years, Talia does somewhat leave the cult. But then when it comes to Isabella, Felicia and Claudia, they stay in the cult and they are loyal to Larry. And Larry just kept brainwashing all three of them. They truly were his little puppets and they would do whatever he wanted. And Larry was still filling their heads about all of these theories about the government wanted to kill him. These powerful people were after him. He was still spouting all of that nonsense. And then there was a time where Larry got sued by his former landlord on the apartment in New York. And Larry fought the case and had his day in court. And he took this opportunity in court over this civil matter of the apartment to spew all of his BS theories about the government. And I'm going to warn you right now, this next section is not going to make sense. But it's not supposed to make sense because it's come from Larry's brain. So Isabella, Claudia and Felicia took the stand in favour of Larry. And it's just like, what the hell? This is just a civil dispute. And the whole time, all three of them were also spewing the nonsense that the government was out to get them all. The government wanted Larry dead. That Bernard Carrick, the police commissioner from 9-11, he hated Larry. He was out to get him, blah, blah, blah. My father made a deal to have me sabotage Larry and steal from him. He made a deal with some people that I don't know to have me come and do this and hurt you. And Claudia started saying that she had known Larry since she was nine years old, which is a load of BS. And she also talked about an elaborate theory that traced back three generations of her family. And as a child, she had heard her grandfather talk about Larry. And Claudia said that her grandfather wanted Larry punished because Claudia's grandfather was working with Rudy Giuliani and Bernard Carrick. Doesn't make sense, does it? And then apparently Bernard Carrick had formulated this huge plan to get Claudia as a child, brainwash her into doing his bidding, send Claudia to Sarah Lawrence College so she could meet Larry, so she could poison Larry and kill him. Again, what the actual hell. And I have to remind you all that Claudia is on the stand in court spewing all of this nonsense. And it's just a civil dispute about an apartment between landlord and tenant. And that's what I mean. None of this makes sense. None of it. If you were confused, then I am too. Felicia took the stand and her testimony was just as confusing. She said that her parents were drug dealers and money launderers, and they had pimped her out as a child, and that her parents were also out to get Larry and poison him. Isabella took the stand and said very similar things, that her parents were out to get Larry and that they wanted him dead by poisoning. In the end, Larry lost his court case against 
his ex-landlord, which does not surprise me. But Larry just used that court case as almost like a performance of his little puppets. And it's almost like he just wanted to get all of his crazy theories on record. And you might be thinking, when the hell does this cult end? Well, thankfully we're getting there. However, we do have one more very significant thing to talk about, and that is that Larry now becomes a sex trafficker. Yeah, he really is the worst. In 2013, not long after the cult first moved to North Carolina, Larry set up a website where he started to offer up Claudia as an escort, and this was completely against her will. But Larry told Claudia that she needed to be an escort to repay her debts. Larry pressured Claudia into making confession videos, confessing to all of the damage that she had done to Larry and his homes. At the same time, you were trying to convince me that you were a good person and regretted ever doing this and that you would never do it again. Why are we doing that? She also started to ramble on that she had been sent by people to poison him. And I assume that's where the story comes from, that her granddad was working with the government and Rudy Giuliani and Bernard Carrick, and that she had been poisoning Larry for years. I'm making a video statement to say that I never stopped poisoning. Spray. And in this video, Larry keeps saying behind the camera, are you saying this against your free will? Has anyone told you to say this? Please talk audibly, Claudia. Are you making this by your own free will? Yes. Anybody pay you? No. Anybody threaten you? No. Anybody coerce you? No. And of course, Claudia is like, no, 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 I'm saying this by my own free will, blah, blah, blah. It's just, oh my God, I want to scream. And in order to repay her debts, she needed to do sex work. So after Claudia made this confession video that she had started to poison Larry years ago, Claudia would now every single night go out and do sex work for Larry. And Larry would charge up to $8,000 for her services. And what is just mind blowing to me is that Claudia was an escort for five years against her will. She was making approximately $10,000 a week. And over that five year period, Claudia made $2.5 million and all of that money went to Larry. Claudia never saw a penny. And in October of 2018, Claudia finally made a stand against this and said that she didn't want to do this anymore. But what did Larry do in response? He took her to a hotel room. He stripped her naked, tied her to a chair, placed a plastic bag over her head before choking her with a leash. But that wasn't all because Larry tore tortured Claudia for the next few hours. He repeatedly cut off Claudia's oxygen supply until she passed out. And he would also pour water over her face with the plastic bag still around her head, essentially waterboarding her. And then just to completely humiliate her and degrade her even more, he cut off all of her hair. But thankfully, after this incident, Claudia left the cult and she never returned. So the cult really is falling apart right now. Talia is no longer living with her dad. I don't know if she's still in the cult. All I know is that she's no longer living there. Claudia has now left. Santos left. Yalitza left. And Dan left. So the only members of the cult still remaining are Felicia and Isabella. Larry's two wives. And they now all move to a house in New Jersey. And for the next year, they live in this weird, warped reality that Larry has created from this cult. Felicia and Isabella dote on Larry. They do everything for him. They wait on him hand and foot. And of course, we know how disgusting he is sexually. So I assume he's probably still sexually abusing the two of them, forcing them to sleep naked and cup his genitals and having threesomes. And he's probably still forcing Felicia to have sex with strangers to get his kicks. But then finally, and I really do mean finally now, in 2019, nine years after the cult first started, it would all come crashing down around Larry Ray. And you're probably thinking, finally, the police have done something. Like somebody has done something, some authority somewhere. But no, no, it wasn't the police that stopped the cults. No, it was actually the New York Magazine. In 2019, a journalist called Ezra Marcus was a previous student at Sarah Lawrence College. And when he was at the college, he heard rumors about this weird college sex cult, like all of these weird 
crazy rumors flying around, things that just don't sound believable. Because if you heard rumors about this cult at college, you probably wouldn't believe it. But Ezra, he was intrigued and he started doing a little bit of digging. He interviewed ex-students from the college. He interviewed people that lived with Larry Ray. And Ezra also managed to track down ex-cult members and interview them. And I'm not sure which cult members he interviewed, but we all know what cult members left. So one of them or multiple. And after all of the research, all of the interviews, an article came out that shocked the world. It went viral online. And then this article prompted authorities to take a closer look at Larry Ray. And then in February of 2020, the New Jersey house that Larry, Felicia and Isabella were living in was raided by the FBI and Larry was arrested and charged with multiple offenses, including sex trafficking, violent assault, racketeering, tax evasion, money laundering, and then many many other financial crimes. And thankfully, Larry Ray is finally in custody. And then whilst he was in custody, because of the article published, a documentary was starting to be made about this case. And in the documentary, they interview most of the court members, including Isabella and Felicia, who were still loyal to Larry. Yeah, you heard that right. Even though Larry has been arrested, Isabella and Felicia are still loyal to him. They're still in the cult. And when they are interviewed, they 100% believe that Larry is innocent, that he is a good person. And it is so heartbreaking to watch. And it's heartbreaking to see how broken they are. However, during the filming of the documentary, Felicia finally woke up. She finally started to get deprogrammed and she was finally realizing how brainwashed she was. And it must have been so difficult for her, so difficult for all of the members, but Felicia especially, she talks about her experience, about not knowing what is real. She almost has to relearn what her life was like because she has been brainwashed so much that she believes that her parents were bad people, that they abused her, that they neglected her, that her siblings tried to kill her, that her parents tried to kill her. And she has literally had to go back through her life, through all of her memories and figure out what is real or not. And Felicia finally turned her back on Larry. Thank God. But for Isabella, the same cannot be said. Authorities kept saying to Isabella that she was a victim victim, that they could help her through this. But Isabella, she would not budge. She was 110% loyal to Larry. And in the end, authorities gave Isabella a choice, either testify against Larry as a victim or be charged as a co-conspirator. And Isabella chose to be charged as a co-conspirator. She was really going to die on that hill for Larry. And finally, in February of 2023, 13 years after the cult first started, Larry and Isabella went to trial. And this is when all of the details on the cult were finally brought to light. Many of the ex-cult members took the stand to testify against Larry. Dan spoke about his humiliation and his trauma from what Larry has done to him. Claudia spoke about the fact that that she was sex trafficked for five years. Felicia talked about that she was brainwashed so badly that she just didn't know what was true or false. Forced to be Larry's wife, forced to have sex with him every day, forced to have sex with strangers. And whilst Larry did not take the stand himself, his defense team definitely tried to paint him out to be the victim. Larry tried to play. Oh, I'm just an old man. I am innocent. I don't know what I'm doing. I have a really bad back. I'm in pain all the time. I'm not joking there. He blamed the fact that he had a bad back. What does that have to do with anything? And I'm like, no one cares, Larry. No one bloody cares about you. And thankfully, in the end, the jury agreed and Larry was found guilty on all charges and was sentenced to life in prison. And then Isabella, she was found guilty of being a co-conspirator and she was sent to prison for four and a half years. So Isabella is in prison. She sits behind bars now and she still has not spoken to her family and she hasn't spoken to her family for over a decade. And I assume that she's still loyal to Larry. And that just makes me so sad because Isabella, I don't know how much she was a co-conspirator, but she is a victim of Larry. She has been brainwashed so badly that she's still loyal to him. In my opinion, she does not deserve to be in prison. She needs help. 
I mean, maybe there's some things that I'm not aware of. Maybe she was more of a co-conspirator. Obviously, I cannot say, but from what I know, she's more of a victim. And that was the case of Larry Ray and the college sex cult, which is one of the most insane cases, insane cults of modern times. And in the aftermath of this case, the ex-cult members, they had to try and rebuild their lives, which I don't know how you do after coming into contact with someone like Larry. Dan had a huge uphill struggle. He struggled to integrate back into society. He hated partying. He couldn't make friends. He did go to therapy, but it made him feel like he was still talking to Larry. However, eventually he found a support group of cult escapees and he got the help that he needed. He is now reunited with his parents and he's doing so much better. And then for Claudia, thankfully she also did get the help that she needed and it did take a lot of work. But she is also now reunited with her parents, with her family. She has a job and she's trying to rebuild her life. And then we have the three siblings, Santos, Yalitza and Felicia. And the parents of those three siblings, they lost contact with their children for over a decade. And they also handed over $200,000 to help pay off their children's debts to Larry. But thankfully, one by one, Santos, Yalitza and Felicia, they all reunited with their parents. And obviously they all had their own traumas to work through thanks to Larry. Santos spent time in a psychiatric facility and at one point he was also homeless. Felicia was left incredibly damaged and she had to just rebuild everything and find out who she was again. But thankfully, all three siblings are doing a lot better and they have each other to support one another. And then a big question that I have about this case, and I think a lot of people have this question as well. What about Talia? What the hell happened to her? And the answer to that is that we don't know. When Larry was arrested, Talia was also investigated as a co-conspirator, but no charges were ever brought against her. And since since then, she has completely dropped off the radar. No one knows where she is. There are no news stories about her. It's just a complete mystery. And given that this cult first started with Talia, I would love to know more about her involvement in this cult. I mean, obviously she was a victim, but did she ever transition into a co-conspirator? And then very sadly, if you remember about halfway through this case, I said that there was another cult member that we didn't know too much information about. And they were a cult member that kind of came and went. And that was Talia's ex-boyfriend, Ivan. Well, after losing his parents, parents and all of the trauma that he was put through from Larry, he took his own life in 2020. And a lot of people have put the blame on Larry for that and what Larry put him through, which is just absolutely heartbreaking. Larry Ray has destroyed so many lives. And I just have no words for Larry. He's definitely one of the most evil people that we have ever come across on this channel. So as always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions on today's case. And don't forget to let me know your case suggestions in the comments down below because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video and I'll see you all in my next one. Bye!